This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Tuesday, the 19th of April, 2022. We have talked about what Christendom is, what the two laws of medieval life are, how a tiny group of Aryan Christian Germans conquered a huge number of Catholic Christian Romans, how the proto-kingdoms of Merovingian France, Lombard Italy, Visigothic Spain, to later be followed by the Muslims, and um, Anglo-Saxon England formed, but how in Germany itself there was no establishment of organized kingdoms, which is kind of interesting. Apparently organized kingdoms are just for the former Roman lands. You get an A on that. For whatever reason, I can't find my grade. Let's see. Uh, we talked also about how Pope Gregory the Great made it possible for the Roman Catholic Church to develop a structure strong enough so that the church could stand up to the royal powers that were growing in Western Europe. Eventually, as a completely independent body. An independent body capable of reviewing the actions of the kings and even rebuking them when they go too far. So Gregory and his Benedictine monk trained self was able to do something uniquely important in the history of Western civilization. I cannot overstate how important this is. This is very important. So listen. What's important about this is that nowhere else on earth do you have royal power not in control of the church or the religion or the shamans and witch doctors in question. Yeah, in other cultures around the world, in the civilized cultures of East Asia, and in the primitive cultures of the Americas, there's always a divergence between the government and the priest class. But push comes to shove, the priests are going to get their butts kicked by the government if they stand up to them too often. So for the most part, the priests, whoever they are, whatever faith they serve, go along in the end with supporting government power. There are exceptions to this, but in general terms, the priests do this. Or like in China, you have a concept called the Mandate of Heaven, where the emperor is supposed to suss out the ever-changing balance of cosmic elemental forces. And like a surfer riding a wave, balance Zheng Guo, the Middle Kingdom, the Chinese Empire, in harmony moment by moment with these changing forces. And if they lose the mandate of heaven, like the current communist government has, with national uh, emergencies, natural disasters, plagues, war, oppression, um, there are people in China who can say the emperor's lost the mandate of heaven and either a new emperor from the same dynasty will take their place or uh, a new dynasty will take over. But that is a rare occasion. A strong emperor wouldn't permit that. So an independent church capable of judging kings and nominate Deus in the name of God? One of the things that distinguishes us in the West is the belief that people like you and me matter. And one of the reasons why people like you and me matter is because of the Judeo-Christian insistence that God made each of us in his image. And therefore, that each of us, no matter how beautiful or ugly, 
smart or stupid, charming or obnoxious, able or disabled, every single human being has some God in them. And having something of God in them is of inestimable, price, inestimable priceless value. Why else would you have inalienable rights? God-given rights. That concept that you have a right to life, liberty, and property came to John Locke around the late 1600s, not out of nowhere like Athena being plucked out of Zeus's forehead full-born, but out of a long tradition of Judeo-Christian valuing of the individual person, of Greek valuing of personal creativity, of Roman valuing of the duties of citizenship, and of the German insistence on us being free men under the king. Free men under a king who will protect our rights. An independent church for a thousand years and more in the Middle Ages, and then the last 500 years after the Middle Ages, is able to look with a critical eye on royal power and policy and reward it when it's in harmony and rebuke or punish it when it's in discord with what the church considers to be basic Christian values. In fact, the group that tried to assassinate Hitler in 1944, the Stauffenberg plot, the Valkyrie plot, was organized by the Roman Catholic Church and by Pope Pius XII himself as an underground movement in Germany to deal with somebody who was applying what the Pope considered to be satanic power in the form of government power in Germany. And there were a number of different groups this is one of the areas where the Roman Catholic Church tried to do a service to the world by stopping Hitler. It didn't work. And that wasn't the only attempt to stop him. None of them worked. Ultimately, his, Hitler had to do the job himself. So the man who killed Hitler is not a hero. Because it was Hitler. It's important that we have an independent church. It's important that the church not be a lapdog to the state. This is one of the things, whether you like Christians or not, it's one of the things that gives you the right to vote, the right to speak, the right to associate with whom you want, the right to worship. At least as an adult, you have these rights. You can look forward to them. If your mom and dad do not want you associating with some bad elements while well, you're a teenager, if you live under their roof, you follow their rules. You rebel against them. That's between you and your parents. But the fact remains, when you turn 18, you can do basically what you want, and you're accountable for your actions. Yes? I'm going to be able to vote in the next election. Good for you. Presidential election. I'm so happy because I thought it was like right at that cutoff where it would just be that. Mm -hmm. oh, I remember the first time I voted for president. It was 1984. So I got to vote for Ronald Reagan in his second uh, election. And I was thrilled. Oh, I was thrilled, because uh, he's my favorite president ever. In any event, uh, so, important uh, that the church is independent. If nothing else, you'll remember that Mr. Gennario went on and on about that, like he does with so many things, because I really think that this is one of the reasons why we have rights. Without an independent church, we don't have rights. With an independent church, we do. Now we come to something I list with two simple words in your notes, but it's almost as important. Tribal law! Let me explain. First of all, the basis of the law of Germans and Goths, the basis of the law of Germans and Goths who conquer Western Empire, the basis of the law of Germans and Goths who conquer Western Empire, to say it one more time, basis of the law for the Germans and Goths who conquer Western Empire is that you are loyal to a king who will protect your rights. Is that you are loyal to a king that will protect your rights. 
is that you are loyal to a king that will protect your rights. We're loyal to a king that will protect your rights. That's the basis of Germanic and Gothic law. So, loyalty to the king is not taken for granted. It's conditional. The king has to do something to earn your loyalty. What the king has to do is protect your rights. So, I, Ragnar, a Germanic warrior. See how blonde and blue haired, blue, blue haired. <laughs> blonde, blonde eyed, blue haired. Yep, there's the family race for you. Uh, anyway, me. All you need is contact lenses and eyes. There, there so. we go. And a wig. Uh, no wig. Oh, God, I have a long blue wig. Yes. Hair. Uh, no, don't picture you two ever to experience that much pain. I'll look like Geralt of Rivia. No, I won't. Never again. In any event, I, Ragnar, am carrying a spear for my king, uh, 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 Carl. Carl. Why not? Carl. And I am willing to fight for Carl and kill for Carl and die for Carl. Because Carl as my king respects me as a free man. He respects my property, my farm, my wife. Any slaves I have. Carl doesn't come around taking my stuff. He doesn't coming around come around sleeping with my women. He doesn't come around stealing my cattle. He doesn't take the food that I grow unlawfully. Carl is owed a few things as my king. He is owed my military service. Yep, I'll fight for him. He is owed a degree of the product, uh, a proportion of the products that's grown on my farm. Yep. He may be owed a little money. Yep. Because he's my king. Got to support my king. Got to make him strong. Strong to do what? Protect my rights. He's, he's in charge. But he's not all powerful godling. No. King Carl is my war leader, and his job is to protect his people. I'm one of them, his people. And as such, let's laugh at Dan when he comes in. Three, two, one. <laughs> Good. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Just dropped that off on my desk. By the way, we wouldn't laugh at you if we didn't care. I would laugh at you. I laugh at me all the time. Oh, good. I know that other people do too. too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're talking about the Germans. Ooh, yes, he came just in time. So what did you learn in school today about the Germans? Carl. Hey, Carl. Carl. By the way, I learned something this morning at King Carl. Carl. I learned that Germans butter their pretzels sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've never heard of this. Like bread. What? Like bread. Yeah, it's weird. No, I was watching a YouTube video about an American football player who plays for the Schiesweig Holstein Unicorns, a German American football team. And he's talking about his life in Germany. And he said there was this, 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 this beer house I went into. And they actually brought butter, so you butter your own pretzels. I was like, butter on pretzels? I'm from New York. Pretzels are big, soft, and have lots of salt on them. And maybe you dip them in mustard. Maybe. I, I don't do that. I like pretzels. But butter? Well, I mean, if you think about it, at carnivals, we butter or eat fried butter. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, don't eat that unless you want to really die soon. But you'll die happy. <laughs> I went to Thanksgiving once with some actually uh, deep and close friends of my family, and they their idea of Thanksgiving gravy was to throw three or four sticks of pure butter into the meat juices and mix it up, and that's it. That's gross. That's, that's it. It was, I'm telling you, it tasted good. But it, I felt my arteries hardening as I spoke. <laughs> my wife, who's an excellent cook, 
evidence. Uh, does not make gravy that way. Yes, there's butter in it. Yes, there's meat juices in it, but there's flour. There's other things. Yeah. Uh, my mom has like a cookie recipe that basically it calls for like, I think it's, it's either one or three sticks of butter. Mm, and butter they, cookies. And they, it's like, they're just chocolate chip cookies, but they're like massive. Uh -huh. But it, like one batch is like probably six of them. And so it's just a <sighs> If you go out hunting or something, you should bring some of those cookies as rations because they'll sustain you. With that much butter, there's a lot of calories in those cookies. And calories is energy. Um, yeah. Uh, once when we went to a Mexican restaurant in Maine, yeah, Maine had okay Mexican restaurants, I guess. They, I think, made a mistake or they were doing a promotion and they served melted butter with their, their best steak for dipping. Even I, who like butter, thought that dipping steak in melted butter. I love lobster. You look, you dip lobster in melted butter. You dip crab in melted butter. But not steak. You dip steak in au jus. In au jus, yeah, which is meat juices. It's blood. It's gravy. I like the blood. I like blood. It's steak. Anyway, so I, Ragnar, served my King Carl because King Carl protects my rights, and treats me like a free man. That's the first principle of Germanic law. It's mutual, it's conditional. Loyalty to the king is not just, ooh, you, you're, the, you're the son of the old... No, the king has to be worthy of it. And if the king's not worthy of it, somebody's going to knock Carl on the head and replace him with Gustav. And Carl knows that Gustav's just waiting to take over. So Carl had better... Um, to be a good king, or he's going to lose it. That's what happened to Bob. That's what happened to Bob. Yeah, Bob wasn't even a German name. No. That's why he got... That's why he exactly. Got yeah, no. He just showed up one day and said, I'm king, and they all laughed and called him a clown, and he became a court fool. Yeah. Bob the Fool. Lots, lots of Bob the Fools. And then there's Carl. If he lost the kingship, he'd meet Carl the Clown. Moving on! <laughs> <laughs> okay. The second aspect of tribal law... My rights, okay, the uh, rights are portable. Just write that down as the second aspect of tribal law. The first aspect of tribal law is um, that, how did I put it? The, uh, the, 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 the king is uh, to protect the rights of the people. The second aspect of tribal law is that rights are portable. That's all. Just rights are portable. Rights are portable. So, I am a Frank. I am Ragnar the Frank. I guess Ragnar is more of a Scandinavian name. A little, little, little. No, 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 no. I've got to be Rolf. I am Rolf. My name in German is Rolf. It means wolf counselor. <laughs> Can you be Frank and, the Frank? What? Can you be Frank the Frank? No, I don't want to be Frank the Frank. He's, he's crazy. He's like Ed in the... Uh, uh, Mufasa movie. Uh, Ed is the crazy hyena. Yeah. Frank the Frank hates being Frank the Frank so much it snaps his mind, yeah. and he's just not okay. right to be around anymore. So I am, I am Rolf, Rolf the Frank, and I've got all the ranks of a Frankish man. I, I, I own property. I have a wife. Uh, I've got some slaves. I've got some cattle. Uh, I grow food on my farm. And when the king needs me, I and my dad, and then I and my brother, and then I and my son will go off and fight for the king. Because I'm a Frank. Ralph the Frank. Not Frank the Ralph. <laughs> but I decide that I want to try to sell some of my goods, because my wife, Hilga, is a great uh, craftswoman. She makes beads and stuff. So I load up with a sack full of my wife's beads. And I'm going to travel. And I go to Visigothic Spain. Just before the, Mo the Moors come. Before the, the Muslims come. Okay, I go into a Visigoth village somewhere in Spain. And there's a murder wall in there. Now, this is, you know, they're from the country and they like it that way. Everybody knows everybody. There's a song, horrible country song. 
for free. Make sure the fan be liking that way. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of country music, for what it's worth. But I have listened to a few of the songs. There are some I even like, but it's rare. It's like rap. Johnny Cash is good. Mm -hmm. Johnny Cash can be very good. He's hardcore. Um, and since everybody knows everybody, the easiest explanation for why Pete got killed is that Ralph... Frank. Frank would do it. Frank would have been the killer. Yeah. But I'm Ralph. I didn't do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Frank the Frank Fowler. Yeah. Oh, that would be important. So... Yeah. I get blamed for Pete's murder because I'm the outsider. I'm the outsider, the foreigner, the outlander. And I'm put on trial. Now, one of the great things about being a goth or a Germanic guy is that my rights come with me. I'm not going to be judged by Namby Pamby Sissy Little Visigothic Law. I have to be judged according to Frankish law. And that means that I've got to have another Frank come in who knows the law to advise the village and, and, and it maybe act as defense counsel. My rights don't go away when I leave the land of the Franks. I'm in the land of the Visigoths. I'm accused of a crime I didn't commit. And I am assured, because my rights come with me, that I will be judged fairly. And if I'm going to be judged fairly, I'm going to be found not guilty because I didn't do it. That's huge. It used to be that if you are a German or a Goth, you had a right to be judged according to your tribe's law, according to your kingdom's law. And while that's not exactly true, if you were to go to France and be accused of murder, you're going to be judged under French law, because that's the jurisdiction. If you go to the People's Republic of China, and you're accused of anything, just kiss your life goodbye, because they have a 99.9% .9 conviction rate. And that's for Chinese people. Bet. For round-eyed barbarians, forget about it. You're Lao Wai, you're going to one of those uh, dark cells for the rest of whatever. Or they'll brainwash you and send you out to work on TikTok or YouTube as an influencer. In any event, uh, not not a good day to be you, so my advice is don't go to China. Go to Taiwan while it's still free. But don't go to Japan. Japan. What? Japan. Yeah, Japan's a great place. So South Korea. Um, Hong Kong used to be a wonderful place, not anymore. In any event, today you go into a foreign land, you're going to be judged as a foreign, uh, as uh, under the local jurisdiction. But... In the time after the fall of Rome, you carry your rights with you. And what that leads to is the word inalienable in what we call inalienable rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, by which he meant property. He just didn't want to justify slavery. So, what does inalienable mean? Well, alien is an outsider. It's a giant creature that has a, a face hugger stage, and then a then a you know a sneaking around serpentine stage, and then it becomes this acid blooded monstrosity that has a giant mouth, and inside that a little mouth that comes and snaps. I bet it's friendly. Yeah. It's just I'm talking about the alien from the movie Alien and then Aliens oh, and other right. movies like that. And yeah, it is yeah. like a monster out of myth. It's 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 scary. I thought facehuggers were separate aliens. No, they're the same. Okay. They're no facehuggers <laughs> are the early stage. You have an egg, and then some moron astronaut goes, Ooh, what's that? And the egg opens up and he goes, Let's look closer. And the the, the facehugger goes, and then burns through the mask, and then, you know, and you take it back to the ship, and then they find this, the you know, the face hugger, sort of like an empty husk, and they say, oh, he's better, let's go have dinner. Yeah, I'm really hungry. I'm numb, numb, and then, chest burster. That's the second stage. Chest burster. And then it scuttles around and eats things, anything it can, and then it becomes... A giant alien, yes. My mom has, like, oh no, my, my grandma has, like, a stuffed 
facehugger thing. It's like a. Oh, that's cool. it, it, she uses it as the elf on the shelf instead of an actual. Elf on the shelf. Oh, that's funny. She puts a Christmas hat on we, it. And we have a little stuffed Cthulhu at home <laughs> for the same <laughs> purpose because my wife and I are weird. Anyway, that's delightful. I'd never heard of that. We, we, we might have to get one. In any event, um, it, no, alien is somebody who's separate or distinct or outside. So, for example, those people, the thousand today, who are crossing our southern border against the law are illegal aliens. What? It's illegal touch. Yeah, it is. Alien is somebody who's not from here. They're an outsider. So... Alien is separateness or otherness. That's that's basically what it means. And it's from the Franc case. Come on, alien? Of course it's from the French. It just has that sound. Alien, I, I guess. Ask Dr. LeBlanc if, uh, if, in fact, alien is from the French. I'm pretty sure it is. But I'd be interested to hear what she had to say. So, inalienable rights means you can't separate a person from their rights. They have they, they have their rights with them. Huh. That's interesting. The only way you can separate a person from their life, their liberty, or their property is by due process of law. Bless you. If I am found guilty of a death penalty offense, I'm going to be executed in a state that has the death penalty. I would like to be shot by a firing squad. If I get executed, that's the way I'd like to go. But most people today in the United States don't even get to ride the lightning. They get a lethal injection, which doesn't always work, by the way. Uh, I don't like lethal injection, but I suppose I guess it's better than hanging. Uh, beheading used to be the, the best way to go. Only nobles were beheaded. So... You know, you really made it in life when you were going to be executed, not by being hanged, but by being beheaded. That's how you, that's how you can tell you made it. <laughs> and then the French develop a mass production beheading device <laughs> called a guillotine, which, oh God, you got a giant razor sharp blade hanging with a railroad uh, tie on top of it, ready to drop on your head. And, uh, yeah, you're gone. There, there are many reports of, of heads, and we'll talk about this next year when we do the French Revolution, of people basically mouthing things with their face and looking around with their eyes in the moments after they've been beheaded and their body twitching around because nobody, the, the nervous system hasn't registered yet that they're dead. Yeah. the nerves keep firing. Yeah. Oh, God. In any event... You cannot separate a person from their rights except by due process of law. So uh, I, I can't have my life taken without being found guilty of a death penalty. The exception to that, of course, is war. In warfare, you're allowed, in fact, you have to kill the enemy and they have to kill you. That's part of the deal. That's why war is kind of scary. Just, just, just a bit. Um, liberty. You can't take my freedom away unless I've done something to warrant it. If, I, if I've done things and I'm found guilty of an imprisonable offense, then I get to go to uh, the big house. And the big house is not a happy place anymore. Honestly, if I were running things, jail, prisoners would be working uh, on, on chain gangs. They would go out every morning. They'd work very, very hard, physical labor in the hot sun, go back to, to, their, to their cells. They'd go to sleep. They'd wake up the next morning. They'd do the same thing. To me, that would be better than the rampant rape and homosexuality that happens in prisons. They're not nice places. I do not, for the life of me, understand why they are permitted to be such terrible places. And what I hear from people is, well, you don't want prisoners to get it to have it too good, do you? No. But on the other hand, I don't want people going in as minor criminals, coming out as hardened criminals, ready to commit as many felonies as they can. Our prison system, like juvie, uh, for, for young people, ju juvenile, it, it, it makes people who are guilty of mild crimes become capable of much more extreme, nasty crimes. They do not do what they're supposed to do. At least in my opinion. Wait, I'm, I'm just being mouthy today. Anyway, um, and property? You can't take my property unless you're a thief without due process. So if I'm a drug dealer and I use my sports car as the place where I sell my drugs, uh, that sports car will be auctioned off by the police if I'm found guilty and the money will be used for anti-drug programs. 
That's reasonable. Okay. Any questions on tribal law? There are three basic classes of people. I'm going to call them estates because that's what the French do. And uh, they are three different classes or types or estates of people. The first is the clergy. The clergy are judged in their own ecclesiastical courts. If you join the clergy, you're not going to be judged by your local king or his courts. You are going to be judged by the bishop or by the monsignor or by the priest or, or by the pope. You are not going to be judged by local courts. This is throughout the Middle Ages. Number one, you're a member of the clergy. You get judged by ecclesiastical courts. You're also not subject to the same kind of taxes or obligations. For example, everyday Frenchmen have to go out and work on the king's roads or, or provide a certain amount of food uh, that they grow to the king. Or they have to fight for the king. Clergy don't do that. Uh, the church pays money to the royals, and the church also performs certain services for the royals. Uh, but the clergy, they work for the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Christian Church, the Latin Church, call it what you want, and they are a people apart. Now, they usually pay for this by not having a family. As time goes on, it is less and less common for priests to have wives and children to the point where to this day, from uh, for the last almost thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church has forbidden priests, monks, and nuns to marry or have children. In earlier times, they did. Now, Protestant ministers, they're allowed to have children. Greek Orthodox priests and Russian Orthodox priests, I believe they're allowed to have children, but not Roman Catholic priests. It's almost the reverse of what the Jews do in terms of eugenics. A rabbi, is uh, usually a very smart Jew who's wise in the scriptures, who has another job. They don't support themselves by being a professional rabbi. They're a rabbi above and beyond whatever they do to make a living. And rabbis are encouraged to have as many children as they can. Because what you're doing is you're breeding the smartest. Roman Catholic clergy in the Middle Ages were among the smartest people in society. And they were taken out of the gene pool. They were not allowed to reproduce after a while. Think about that. It's like Western civilization was breeding for stupidity. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's like having cattle, and instead of breeding the biggest, beefiest, fattest cows uh, to the biggest, beefiest, fattest bulls, so you get bigger, beefier, fatter cattle, you, you breed the scrawny ones to the other scrawny ones, and you end up with scrawnier cattle over time. Why? But, then, but the, the church didn't view it from a, a gene genetic standpoint. They didn't view it from the standpoint of modern biology. They said that a priest's primary duty is to God, not to family. And the second group are nobles. Nobles are knights. They're sort of half nobles, half warriors. Knights, barons. Barons like rule in a town. In a valley. Counts. Counts. They do not, yes. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. It's not like the Count of Counting from Sesame Street, who I love. Almost as much as I love Oscar the Grouch, who is my favorite character. I hate freaking Big Bird. Elmo didn't exist when I was a little kid. I hate Elmo. No, he Elmo hadn't been invented Elmo yet. No, Elmo should die. In fact, if Oscar the Grouch. Has any of the gumption I think he does, he's out for Elmo. Strangled. He is. Yeah. Although I could, I could see Bert doing Elmo in, too. Bert has his issues. Have you ever seen online, um, there's some of it that's a little edgy. There's a website called Bert is Evil. And it has photo. It's from the '90s, but it's still around. It has photographic evidence. They've got Bert and Hitler, uh, and Bert and the Ayatollah from Iran, and, and Bert, you know, blowing up things. Uh, and there are videos of smoking Bert being violent towards Ernie. It's 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 funny, but it's very nasty funny. Yes. Have you seen uh, Elmo going on shows? No. He acts like a spoiled brat. He acts like a TV kid. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I could see that. I'll look that up. 
Uh, in any event, how the heck did I get the sesame? <laughs> ah, the count counts. One, two, three. Yes. Uh, a count rules a county. Believe it or not. So, a baron would rule Coeur d'Alene, or actually Coeur d'Alene being a city would rule, be ruled by a mayor, but like Rathrum would have a baron up there or whatever. But there'd be a count ruling over a region about the size of a county, and then there's a duke who would rule over a region that's the size maybe of part of Idaho. Like North Idaho would have a duke. What? Eh? Huh? Didn't hear I didn't, I didn't hear either. Okay, nothing to hear here. <laughs> nothing to see here. Move along. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Anyway, uh, and above the barons, counts, and dukes uh, is the royal family. And the royal family has princes and kings, and in one case, emperor. And that's later. So the nobles rule and they fight. The nobles command the warriors. The nobles run the society, and they protect the people, and they enforce the law. So that's the job of the nobles. So the, the clerics pray, the nobles fight. So you got religious caste, warrior caste. So what's the third group? The third group are commoners. Everyday people doing everyday things. Carpenters, blacksmiths, and makers of rings, I guess. Sauron? No. Uh, everyday people doing everyday things. So, commoners include farmers, peasants, serfs, slaves. They include craftsmen. Uh, they include people who live in towns. They include bankers and merchants. They include lawyers, when lawyers are invented. Um, scribes. Basically, everyone who's not a member of the clergy or the nobility is a commoner. And we're going to go into a much more detailed uh, picture of feudal society probably tomorrow. But for now, just know there are these three types of people, and you are one. The only one that you can become is a clergyman. Nobles become high clergy, commoners become low clergy. If you're a woman like me, you can marry into nobility. That's true. However, just like the story of Romeo and Juliet, Families do get involved. So, if somebody, uh, if, if you were a noble, daughter of a noble, say, a, a, I don't know, a baroness, his daughter, and you fall in love with the local drover, like in Australia, which my niece loved as a movie, because he threw water on his back. Oh, so sexily. <laughs> in any event, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it weird. I'm just <laughs> So you fall in love with a commoner. It's not like your family's going to go, yeah, we'll pay for the wedding. No, you're probably not going to be allowed to marry a commoner. Unless the commoner was like a superhero. Unless the commoner like saved your father's life or, or saved the barony from invasion or invented something amazing. If on a rare, and I mean, I mean, bleepingly rare occasions, a commoner is raised to the nobility, either through marriage or through being knighted or, or something like that. That did happen, but it was so, so, so rare. Like winning the lottery, basically. And if you were a commoner and some nobleman became smitten with you, uh, it's very unlikely he would be allowed to marry you. The class system reinforced itself uh, wherever possible. Were there exceptions? Sure. But again, they were rare. Now, high culture. Uh, let's talk about music. I am going to play for you some music. I am going to play for you some music, but I've got to turn off the video because God forbid I get copyright striped. So, for you at home, see you tomorrow.